good evening everyone and uh, good morning to all the international viewers this webinar is an initiative of usi in collaboration with donier and healthware eswl dialogue series session 1 and uh, today we have a uh, eminent uh, international faculty gg tally and uh, past president and a very senior member of urological society of india dr mohesh deshai who is well known to everyone and is a pioneer in the stone management and we have dr c malligarjun the president elect of the urological society of india so we have i welcome the members of the urological society of india the sark members from the sark country the residents and all the international viewers as all of you know that eswl has been uh, waning out is fading in a, in the as a management tool in uh, stone disease but in the current pandemic uh, covid 19 eswl has come back uh, as a significant uh, uh, armamentarium in the management of um, stone disease and uh, it is uh, showing that eswl still has a lot to play in euro the management of urolithiasis with this we have initiated this dialogue series there are four sessions today we are having the session 1 and we have eminent international faculty dr tally and eminent indian faculty professor mahesh deshai and dr c mallu garjun who will be deliberating on uh, what is the status of eswl in the era of minimally and very minimally invasive uh, um, uh, invasive management of uh, stone disease and where it stands now and what will be the future of eswl we expect a very good uh, interaction between the faculties and the audience and with this few words i welcome you all again to the session 1 of eswl dialogue series now i would request the president of urological society of india dr anand kumar to say a few words over to you sir good evening good morning and good afternoon depending on which time zone our delegates are i bring greetings from urology society of india to all the participant of this wonderful webinar and i also welcome our international guest uh, dr jiria uh, tayaz or dr telly i hope i have pronounced your name correctly and world renowned our senior colleague professor mahesh desai malikarjun and dr patnakar arun chawla rajiv tiki and all the members who are participating in this wonderful webinar i must say that uh, ura uh, this extra carpulian shock wave lithotripsy is one of the one of the best invention happened in urology in christian chauze in 1980 over the world how the stone can be managed even without doing any invasion in the body just destroying the stone from outside it was almost unimaginable at that time when he sent his first paper to american urology association it was rejected he never believed that it can happen and then lot of things have developed at that time i was in residency and we saw the picture of hm3 uh, patient in bath tub in the journals and it was so we discussed in journal club it was so exciting and then things started changing and i think in india first time it came in hm4 in delhi then in calcutta and then other models have started coming we got lithotripsy litho star that was the second model after the alinea institute in 91 that is the siemens litho star 
electromagnetic shock wave lithotripsy and we were very excited we used to finish the work and then do lithotripsy in the evening and it was wonderful to see how stones are breaking and how stones are being passed and uh, because of that our department got to push because there was no other lithotripter in the whole of the up and people were coming from all over places to for the stone management and then uh, slowly other models have come initially there was a lot of ad advancement has happened initially to be ecg gated respiratory gated and lot of analgesia and drip required then it became outpatient treatment then lot of machines came and became very popular then suddenly it started fading away and uh, because there is a competition has started mini park and ultra mini park and rirs and uh, it has started going down but i still believe lithotripsy has got the biggest advantage and it has a definite role in management of the well selected cases where the results will be good and it is the least invasive but you have to select the case very well and in this uh, webinar we are going to discuss all aspects of lithotripsy and what is the current status and i'm sure lithotripsy is going to come back with more newer development newer software and newer way of doing it and it effect efficacy will go it will improve and it will be again a very popular mode of therapy and that i think will happen in next 5 to 10 years and then minimally invasive procedure will go further down so with this preamble i would like to pray for the good health of all the members their loved ones and their family please take care of yourself stay safe covid virus has not gone away it is still there we, everybody is waiting for the vaccines to come so that we get developed immunity and start having physical meeting everybody is missing physical meeting very badly and uh, with this i welcome you again to this webinar and uh, back to rajiv tp thank you sir for your enlightening words now i would request uh, uh, chairman indian school of urology professor rajiv sood to say a few words over to you sir thank you dr rajiv tp this is a great occasion that uh, so many uh, world renowned uh, uh, faculty is in in our indian school of urology uh, program uh, in uh, urological society of india and this is the first one of the series and that is eswl uh, dialogue series session 1 this uh, link this this uh, um, subject which has been started yes uh, on eswl this series is very important because it is regaining the role and with the new advent of uh, imaging our uh, dual energy ct uh, ct is when we know the composition of the stones beforehand house fill unit beforehand the uh, various uh, indicative uh, factors beforehand for for the for for this uh, modality uh, this is very important uh, discussion uh, going on dr grit tally dr mahesh desai dr c malkarjun all of all are going to deliberate on this and this is of course the first of uh, this series and we are going to be enlightened in these times of covid era as our president dr anand kumar has mentioned uh, greetings to and soon we will be uh, completing this series when the other uh, sessions are going to be delivered and deliberated in this series welcome to all again from indian school of urology well uh, back to dr rajiv tip thank you sir for your uh, kind words now i would request uh, the convener of today's program dr suresh patangar to take over the proceedings over to you sir hello very good evening to 
all my friends in USI, Indian School of Urology, all the faculty members, and all the participants. Uh, today, we are talking about a dialogue in ESWL. Uh, before I start, I just want to give a couple of instructions to all the attendees that uh, before we start, they should positioning the video of the speaker video by clicking the top bar and dragging the window. Then coming to the today's overview of the meeting, there are very interesting topics in this dialogue. 30 years of ESW in India, Mahesh Bhai is going to talk. Dialogue of influence of imaging on ESWL by Dr. Tail and Dr. Desai. The art of ESWL, the four dimensions, a new dimension has been added to Again, Dr. Tai is going to talk. And there will be a case discussion of unique case studies, uh, which will be moderated by my close friend, C. Malikarjun, and others will be Dr. Tai and Mahesh Desai. Then there will be a questions and answers and then will be concluded remarks by the Dr. Raju Tipi. Uh, before I uh, hand over to introduction, just a couple of things I just want to mention in today's meeting. ESWL has been there for many years. So when I talk to one of my colleagues that today we are going to have a meeting on ESWL, sir, is it an old wine in new bottle? I said, no, it's a new wine in new bottle. Lot of changes have taken place. And with the lithotripsy coming in a big way with new technologies, probably as our president Anand Kumar has said, it might take away the minimally techniques of PCNS, say super perk, mini perk, micro perk, and it might come back as it came back 30 years back. What are the new things that are happening? One is the, there are challenges between the contact, between the patient skin and the machine, that challenge has been overcome. Then we are going to have a camera inside the therapy head, which is give a better visualization of the patient and the coupling cushion. Then comes the imaging, because especially the stones of less density, masked by the bone structures, ball gases, by increasing the resolution of the fluoroscopic image will increase the visualization of the stone and the better success rate. So there are many new things are taken place in the new technologies, which are all of us are eager, rather coming in your way for a long time. I will just start uh, introducing today's speakers and then we'll start with the questions. The speakers are very well known. Uh, what we need is Dr. Git Tai is a from Belgium, as we see here, he's a graduated urologist in 1984, almost the same year I got graduated in 1980, he was there. And you can see a very senior person who has got active interest in giving the various talks, performing live surgeries, and still in spite of being a surgeon, he has got interest in ESWL. He has worked with the legendary figure of Dr. Christian Chausse, who is the pioneer of this, or originator, or father of this ESWL. So we welcome, sir. We'll, we are very eager to look forward to get some new insights for this new wine in new bottle. Then the next speaker is Mahesh by our stone man. Stone man, or I can say stone king of Indian urology or the world urology. I mean, look at his biodata. It cannot be spoken into a few words. Uh, surgeon, excellence is par. Teacher, excellence at par extremely friendly, which is more human, I would say that is more important. Not only scholarly, but being a human is more uh, important. We had uh, many experiences of Mahesh Bhai being a thorough gentleman. Then comes our C. Malikarjun, a junior stoneman, I would say that, spreading the message of urology everywhere, performing various workshops, again a surgeon of excellence, uh, he has just started his new 
set up of Asian Institute of Nephro Urology. I knew I had an opportunity to be there and I'm sure it is also going to become another urology hub down south. So with this, I over to the first speaker, Dr. Tai. Again, for all the delegates, questions and answers, you click here, type in your question and press enter. Thank you. Now over to Dr. Desai, who will be talking about the 30 years of ESWL in India. Bhai, bhai. Over to you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Mahishma, are you there on the screen? Yeah, we can see your slides. Please start. You can see it, right? Yeah, yes. Okay. So I'm going to speak about the 30 years of ESWL um, um, in, um, uh, in India. And um, there was a paradigm shift in uh, 1980 when from open surgery to minimal invasive surgery and the ESWL, PCNL and erotroscopy was uh, uh, discovered. And of course, as you said, Christian Chosi, the father of the ESWL, he created a, a phenomenal thing is uh, extracorporeal trochoelithotripsy. And with this machine, a Dornier one, uh, he, he could do extracorporeal trochoelithotripsy ma machine. It was a non-invasive, um, uh, easy to uh, use, a very effective as you see in the picture. And it was very friendly. It was a we all were happy that uh, now the, the, the open surgery is disappeared and this will be going to be a, a minimal invasive surgery. And uh, uh, Wickham he published a paper of 1000 cases with 91.8% success rate. And he thought that the ESWL was used in 92% PCNL and urotroscopy was a very little. So we thought we'll buy the ESWL, but um, uh, it was a costly machine. So we were just thinking, and by that time, the Sigura published another paper of 1,000 consecutive patients of uh, PCNL with 98.3% uh, results. So we thought on the cost, it is um, better to have a PCNL and erotroscopy first. And we started with the PCNL in 1985 and then um, um, uh, in the erotroscopy. And still we realized that ESWL was uh, getting more popular and with um, uh, PCNL, open surgery came down. But with ESWL, you can see in, in, uh, when Peter Alkin pu published his paper, the, the, the PCNL also came down. And the ESWL become the, the main goal uh, for treating the stone. And in India, we had now established 241 lithotripsy center all over. Uh, and we went for a sonolith in in uh, 1989, so not in 2000, which is particularly had a spark wall, uh, spark gap uh, technology uh, and ultrasound um, um, uh, localization of the of the stone. We were used to ultrasound, so I went for the for that. So we were complete in 1989. We had a ESWL, PCNL, urotroscopy. We could combine all this thing together. We all, of course had open surgery and a chemolysis. But the factor determining the choice of the management, the site, size, type of the stone, degree of obstruction, duration, hydronephrosis, renal functional impairment and infection. Based on this, we decided which is the best treatment which we can use. For a years, we thought there's a stone less than three centimeters with a minimum obstruction, good function, no infection, no distal obstruction. We can use years. Why the PCNL? We thought we would use it for the stone, which is more than three centimeter or a partial and complete stegon or gross hydronephrosis, impaired function, infection or failed ESWL. But we could use both of them in combination, PS, PCNL and ESWL for the residual stone or ESWL and the residual stone, we can do the, the PCNL or we can do a combination PCNL, ESWL, PCNL, what you call a sandwich therapy or a ESWL and then PCNL wash. For the upper erotic stone, which was a significant uh, at that time, we can do ESWL in C2, 
push and bang to make the result better or a pull retrograde uroscopy anti grade cnl and lumbotomy so we had many options of uh, treating the the thing now we use the eswl um, uh, very well and these are the analysis of the complete cases what is important was size and site and we found the stone in the pelvis stone in the middle calyx and stone in the upper ureter is better fragmented on a eswl while lower calyxal stone may be fragmented but not cleared and upper calyx also probably we had less lizard because ultrasound and the upper calyx is usually above the ribs and sometimes it was difficult to localize and then uh, and then target it so we had uh, but as the stone size increases you could see that the clearance rate also decreased but it was best for the stone which was less, less than a 2 to 3 cm and the looking at the number of shock the smaller the size of the uh, stone the shock wave we were, we were using was less than 2000 but when the stone size increased to more than 3 cm the almost double amount of shock wave needed to be used and we have to find out what is the effect of the shock wave on the kidney so we analyzed about 2500 cases 20% they were did not completely uh, took the treatment they took the first first sitting and then they disappeared or they went for another treatment but we had 80% completed the treatment out of that 80% we successfully cleared only thing is that took a little bit more time it took almost a year to completely clear the stone and complications were 10% but small Steinstrasse uretic obstruction infection or sometimes we require an auxiliary procedure those cases which failed um, uh, uh, in that twelve percent, we did a PCNL and cleared the stone. So initial enthusiasm little came down as uh, the number of sitting were required more, and uh, the clearance was not hundred percent. So we thought we must do something. So what is most of the most important is optimum maintenance. Luckily, we had an engineer from the company who stayed in Nadiad and who looked after this machine, and then we had a better result we modified our indication we reduced the size from three to two centimeter stone density we we consider and a shock your planning now that time we didn't have a ct scan where we can do the household unit but we had a plain x-ray where we can diagnose calcium um, uh, monohydrate stone here is a mixed stone and here is a dihydrate stone and we found that in mixed stone and dihydrate stone the stone clearance was much more we also did a treatment planning Relocalization after every 200 shocks so that we know exactly because stone is likely to move once you are starting a, a shock wave now with the with the impact it might move or it might break and go into a different calyx or a different place and you have to relocalize limiting the shock wave to 800 to 12,000 per sitting i'll tell you why because we started a booster therapy a second sitting after 48 hours then anatomical location was important ultrasound we, we were a bit used to it but we also used the fluoroscopy in later on and, um, and that gave us a, a better targeting if no fragmentation after first sitting alternate therapy like PCNL was was done and sometimes when the stone fragment and small stone size is small and we cannot see we use a color doppler and the color doppler gave us sprinkling effect and we could localize the and break the stone there that helped us to clear the stone completely at the same time reduce the number of uh, shock wave one most important thing in the lower calyxal anatomy because we found the stone in lower calyx did not clear uh, and we have to select the cases properly especially this is the paper which we published um, and um, uh, here the angle uh, between the pelvis and the ureter was important infundibular width was important and the anatomy of the lower calyx or a length of the lower calyx was important we found the residual stone in 64 percent of the patient when the pelvic castle angle was less than 90 percent only 12 percent in those with angle more than 90 percent the 70% of the patient had a residual stone where infundibular diameter was less than 4 millimeter and 16% of those with a diameter more than 4 millimeter. 78% had a residual stone in a complex calyxal pattern and 12% with a simple calyxal pattern. So it was important to have an IVP 
just you see the stone and don't go for the ESWL. Important is to, to see the IVP, how the kidney is working, how it is draining, what is the skeletal anatomy, what is the outlet uh, uh, anatomy, and that was important to do it. And we found by this modification, we improved our reason. You see, it was a constant application of the, the knowledge with the X-ray ultrasound, we could um, clear the stone in 87% as, as compared to 80%, 46% had a single sitting as compared to 37%, and post-ESW post procedure reduced to 3% from 4 to 4%, and then our number increased. So after about 10 years, we had went for a Dornier compact delta because we thought that the imaging is very, very important. Here we had an X-ray imaging as well as we had an ultrasound together. And we can use the, 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 the treating head um, on the, from the supine pose in an abdominal way also for ectopic kidney. And we can see the, um, the monitor the stone uh, fragmentation on a simultaneous sonography. And then here, the adjustable coupling, which is, uh, which is very important uh, to target the stone and then make sure that there is no uh, 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 reduction of the power. And in children also, we used it, especially we protected the lower uh, lungs and, if, and the gonads if whenever is necessary. Now, only a few words about the frequency. Lower the frequency, better the fragmentation. I just will go faster as uh, time is short. The, the, so lower the frequency, better the fragmentation. The shock wave rate will be reduced to less than 30 shock because when the shock um, rate is less, the size of the fragment were less when treated at the 30 shock per minute. Then increase the energy gradually to prevent the vasoconstriction and ischemic injury to the kidney or a development of the hypertension or some. And especially in pediatric, we reduce the num number of the um, uh, energy so that the kidney is, uh, uh, is vulnerable to the shock waves. Now here, most important part of the thing is we monitor the uh, shock waves uh, hitting the stone during the procedure. And you can see here, the stone is impacted and you can see the movement. And so it, every shock count because every shock costs money and here, um, uh, and then here, making sure that there is no uh, focusing is proper and um, uh, stone breaking is better. Sometimes we use a propofol infusion because here to reduce, sometimes patient is not under the uh, anesthesia. Uh, and you see the, the, the excursion of the kidney is much more and it goes out of the focus. But when we use uh, the pseudoanalgesia or propofol, you can see that you can target the stone properly and then it, it hits the stone and we can have less number of shock waves and it can have a better fragmentation rate. So it is very important to target and ultrasound does give you a very good effect of doing. As person, I mean the stone, which is the radiolucent, excellent for the ultrasound for localization and breaking the stone. Now, this is a few of the x-rays here. You can see is um, uh, a, a porous stone and in the tubes, then uh, two centimeter stone. And here in one sitting, all the stone broken and has come down into the lower calyx. So excellent result. Here is the ectopic kidney and patient was 101 kilogram. We did it localization from supine. This was the IVP and the stone broke and there was the Steinstrasse. We gave a second sitting to Steinstrasse and cleared the Steinstrasse. And slowly after some time, we gave more sitting to the stone and it was very obese. And in ectopic kidney, we could successfully clear the stone. What is booster therapy? Initially, when we give a shock, the peripheral part of the stone breaks easily. And this, this fragment, when you give a next shock, it stops the fragment, this shock wave reaching the center. So what we did, we, we use about 800 to 1000 shock and then we stopped. And then after 48 hours, we went again. By the time these fragments were washed out and then we could break the stone. And here is the example. This is a stone. And then after the first sitting, you can see the stone is broken. There are, there are, is expanded. But after the second sitting, you can see it is fragmented very well. So it is a trick little we did. We did a booster therapy and that, that uh, completed the stone in a one hospital stay. Sometimes we use a large stone um, because it was a porous stone. You can see calcium oxalate dihydrate stone, good functioning kidney. And uh, we were not very sure in the beginning, but here you can see in the one sitting completely fragmented the stone. You can see the upper ureter Steinstrasse. And then we gave a second sitting after the 
48 hours and then within one month stone was completely cleared so you got to select imaging is very very important the especially now that ct scan is there we have a much more um, uh, thing is another stone which is in the pelvis the calyces are difficult even for a pcnl and here we did a, a eswl with the one setting you can see the stone is fragmented and the stein strass size is there and completely clear again there is another stone in the upper ureter and then it has been completely clear. so here at the moment we were doing flexible ureteroscopy and thing but you can see if you have a proper imaging and if you have a proper targeting you can clear the stone and without any intervention similarly here a upper ureteric stone what i'm trying to say that the stone is similar stone at the moment we are doing ureteroscopy but if you plan it properly for example the donier uh, i mean machine must be used by a doctor not by a technician and then you can you can target it better here the stone localization is done uh, with ultrasound as well as for, with the with the x-ray and what we planned is the upper part of the stone is targeted because the upper part has a lots of fluid around it and the dilated system and upper part is uh, 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 targeted first and then we did a relocalization of the stone and then we use the middle part of the stone to be targeted and then afterward, we did a lower part of the stone. The 600 more shock were given to the lower part of the stone. What is the result? They have used less than 2,000 shocks. And here is the stone. And in one, they can completely broken. See that? It is all the ESW, all, all fragments were, were uh, in one sitting is complete fragmentation of the stone. And then here you can see the stones are fragmented right from the kidney to the bladder. You can see the stones are passing by. And in that, if you have remaining, you can always give. What is our, our, our observation over the last uh, few years is awareness by the patient that, that, the stone, uh, uh, that this minimum invasive treatment is given. They come earlier. Now there is a less Togon calculus, only 12% in our series. While almost 42% had a stone less than 2 centimeter. Uh, 3.3 centimeter, 3.3% uh, had a 1 centimeter and 32% had a 2 to 3 centimeter. Nearly 80% of the patient had a stone which is less than 3 centimeter. And if it is right, it is calcium exolate dihydrate or a mixed stone, you can certainly can think about. So at the moment in Western world, everybody is doing, or in here also, everybody is doing URS and then come. Uh, clearing the stone, which is up to two to three centimeters and using a PCNL for a stegon calculus. What we are preferring is the mini cork and then uh, using the standard PCNL here. But what I feel with the present decrease in the size of the stone and a situation like COVID where we would like to do it uh, is outpatient and is, as a, a non-invasive procedure, I think with a better machine and better imaging, ESW will take care of nearly uh, 50 to 60% of the stone. You can use the mini perk for the little bit harder stone or a stone in an awkward collecting system or a standard piston for a stegon calculus. I think that is a future. And I think um, uh, you have to plan according to um, the stone and according to the technology. I think technology is here to help us. And I think ESWL is uh, the right way uh, to do for the minimal invasive surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Suresh. Yeah, Mahesh Bhai. Yeah. Excellent talk. Excellent talk. Uh, very extensively you have covered and first time uh, senior urologist says it should be done by urologist. That was a message, I think, a very important message uh, should be given to all of us because we take it as a coffee break. Lithotripsy means a urologist is sitting outside and technician is doing the uh, job. And probably that is one of the reason, the results what you have got, may, many of us couldn't get at it. And thank you very much, sir. Uh, your interest, even in the ESWL, is really remarkable. Thank you very much. The next uh, talk is a dialogue of imaging, which is most important because unless you are able to image the stone, you are not able to break it. And I invite uh, Dr. Tai and again Mahesh Bhai for the dialogue of influence of imaging on ESWL. Over to both Mahesh Bhai and Dr. Tai.
Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening uh, in India. I would like to thank you for inviting me to give uh, a lecture at this uh, ESWL dialogue series. And I thank, thank uh, Dr. Mahesh Desai for a very comprehensive overview of uh, ESWL in the, uh, in the history in uh, India. And I would like to have my slides, I think, uh, from Samir, he would put up my slides. Okay. Okay. First of all, I would like to talk to you about the influence of imaging uh, in ESWL. Can I have the next slide? Uh, okay. So there's a number of factors that will influence ESWL outcomes. So you need a good litter tripter, uh, stone location, stone composition are important, but probably the most important in the quality of treatment outcome is the imaging and of course the operator skill. Next slide. Now, uh, traditionally we are using fluoroscopy or ultrasound in uh, ESWL and there's a number of advantages and disadvantages to both imaging modalities. For fluoroscopy, the uh, advantages are of course that you can do in situ treatment of all ureteral stones and also of all stones uh, everywhere in the urinary tract. There's a shorter learning curve because everyone is, is familiar with uh, fluoroscopy. Disadvantages are there's no targeting of radiolucent stones. Small kidney stones are sometimes difficult to locate. In my opinion, a very uh, important disadvantage is that there's no real-time image. You can only do fluoroscopy once in a while. You cannot expose the patient to radiation the whole time. So radiation exposure is also an uh, important concern when you are using fluoroscopy. Advantages of ultrasound is that you can target radiolucent stones. It is easier to target small kidney stones. You have real-time image. That means that you can adapt to targeting easier and faster. And of course, there's no exposure to radiation. Disadvantage is that the in situ treatment of uh, ureteral stones is uh, difficult or impossible. And also the learning curve is a bit longer. <clears throat> now you can have inline, inline scanners or ultrasound lateral isocentric scanners. The advantages of an inline scanner is that you have an easier dissociation between multiple stones. There's easier targeting of very proximal and very distal ureteral stones. And the uh, ultrasound is in the shockwave path. Disadvantages, however, is that the rib shadows may hide stones from view. You have a poorer image quality. It has a negative effect on shockwave output and the scanners can be damaged by the shockwaves. The lateral isocent centric scanner, so the outline scanner, gives easier targeting of small kidney stones. The most appropriate window can be chosen for kidney stones. In this way, you can vo avoid rib shadows. You have a better appraisal of fragmentation. You can start with freehand scanning to give you an orientation of where the stone is exactly, and the image quality is far better. On the other hand, very proximal and prevesical ureteral stones are sometimes difficult to find. And very oddly, very small kidney stones that are in the renal pelvis are sometimes difficult to find in very thin patients. Now, when you do ultrasound guided uh, ESW of the renal calculus, you see that you can uh, take advantage actually of the uh, respiratory movements to uh, have each shock hitting the stone. Because you have real time image, you can have a nice balancing of the stone in the focus. And with outline ultrasound, the resolution of the kidney and the stone is better. Next. Um, for the ureter, it's the same. You have a continuous monitoring of ESWL. You have a view in real time, and it is also easier with a uh, lateral isocentric scanner than with the uh, inline scanner. And then you have the concept of dual imaging. You can either have uh, ultrasound or fluoroscopy, but the ideal world, of course, is if you can use both at the same time or consecutively. The advantages are that it is easy to switch between X-ray 
and ultrasound, you have a much shorter learning curve because you can assist your ultrasound with uh, fluoroscopy. You have the continuous monitoring of the real-time image of the ultrasound. And of course, you have a considerable reduction in ex radiation exposure. Now, which image should you uh, choose for which stone X-ray you can use for the entire urinary tract? Ultrasound will be very challenging in the mid and the distal ureter, and dual imaging will give you advantages for renal stones, UPJ stones, and proximal ureteral stone. Now, uh, Donier has developed Optivision, which is uh, actually an electronic uh, uh, manipulation of the posts of the image. So on the left, you see the image without the electronic manipulation. And on the right, you see a far better contrasted image with Optivision. The same here for a stone which is covered there or uh, overlapping the bowel. With Optivision, you have a far better image. Another uh, advantage of ultrasound is that you can use a color doppler. The color doppler gives the advantage of the twinkling artifact and with the twinkling artifact you can detect stones in absence of an acoustic shadow. It can also help in determining the end of the treatment and it can increases the specificity in the detection of a stone. The uh, spectral doppler can help you uh, to quantify hit or miss because it gives an acoustic signal and it can help you in determining the end of treatment. What you will see is that your uh, uh, Doppler signal becomes broader and it gives like a, a sound of a graveling sound which indicates that your uh, treatment is progressing. Uh, and now I think we can go over to the discussion on imaging and uh, the influence of imaging uh, on, ultras on uh, ESWL. So what is your preferred choice of imaging during ESWL? I think you can vote and then we will see what the preference of the uh, participants is. I see quite a number of dual imaging, which is very interesting. And for the rest, I see that ultrasound and X-ray are uh, going up uh, uh, neck to neck. So it's quite interesting that uh, a lot of people are using ultrasound or dual imaging. I think it's the time for discussion now. That's as yep. indicated. Okay. Uh, we can st start the discussion. Hello. Uh, yeah. We can Hello. start the discussion. Dr. Desai and Dr. Tai will discuss what are their views about the imaging in lithotripsy. Over to you, Dr. Desai and Dr. Tai. Okay. okay. Dr. Telly? Yes, Mahesh. Um, you know, one of the problem I found um, uh, while doing ultrasound is that uh, stories when it is a little lo long, it casts the acoustic shadow and the lower part of the stone you cannot see. You can only see the, the, the uh, uh, superior part. And sometimes that, that, that is a problem when I was doing ultrasound alone. But when I combine that with the, um, the fluoroscopy, then um, I could do both. I, what I wanted with ultrasound was only localization. And with, uh, with, with the x-ray, uh, with the fluoroscopy, I could see, uh, I could target it 
uh, better. What was your experience? Uh, the thing, of course, with ultrasound is that uh, with respiratory movements, the stone goes up and down, and sometimes part of the stone will not be visible at a certain time. The advantage of ultrasound, however, is that you can adjust your uh, targeting during the treatment. You don't have to stop the treatment, and you can continuously monitor the treatment and adjusts according to uh, the image that you are seeing. Uh, in my experience, I use, or I can use uh, fluoroscopy in the kidney, but only uh, I would not, well, I try to use uh, ultrasound as much as possible. Normally we do about 65% of stones uh, with ultrasound and then about 20% with X-ray, the rest with the combined uh, dual imaging. The, the thing is that when the, when the uh, respiratory movements move the stone in and out, then of course, sometimes you will not see uh, the stone completely, but it is easily adjusted because of the real-time image. Now, you know, um, if you have, a, say, one and a half centimeter stone or a two centimeter stone in pelvis, or two centimeter in lower calyx, or any, any of the middle calyx or somewhere. So would you have a different modality for treatment for the pelvic? Pelvic, I, you know, uh, for a ESWL, or would you be as, as safe to do the ESWL for two centimeter stone in the lower calyx or a middle calyx or upper calyx? In general, our upper limit, uh, for treatment with ESWL will be two centimeters. And it, it makes no big difference if it is in a, in a calyx or the renal pelvis. Of course, when you are shocking a stone in the renal pelvis, you can expect that with good fragmentation, the uh, fragments will descend very fast into the ureter. So you can have problems with Steinstrasse or colic. When you have a stone in the lower calyx, on the other hand, the usually fragmentation is good. But there you know, uh, and this will depend, as you have said, on the anatomy of the uh, lower pole calyx, you will have a delayed uh, ex uh, evacuation of the fragments. So it can take some time before the fragments evacuate. And if you have an uh, unfavorable uh, factors of the calyx, that it is a long calyx, a narrow calycial neck, a very acute angle, then your uh, uh, evacuation of fragments will be slow, or sometimes even uh, they will not pass. Now, you know, in the pelvis, there is no kidney around. So you can give whatever number of shock or you can give the more power. But in calyx, there is a kidney around. Do you think that the number of shock you give to pelvis or calyx would be uh, different? because of the presence of a kidney around the stone on the, in the calyx? I, I'm usually very careful. So uh, not all pelvic stones are outside of the kidney. So you can have an extra uh, pelvic, uh, extra renal pelvis or a more intrarenal pelvis. So I would not say that the number of shocks or the energy differs a whole lot from uh, where the stone exactly is. Um, what we have seen with the optical coupling, when we have a, a coupling free of bubbles in the uh, coupling area between the patient and the uh, therapy head, then we can reduce the total energy by about 43%. That means we need 25% less shocks and we need about 22 or 23% less energy to fragment the stone. And this is, I think, a very big uh, advantage. It will also reduce your treatment time with about 25%. And this is very difficult to prove, but theoretically it should also reduce uh, your risk of adverse effects due to the shock waves. Now, uh, I was just uh, wondering, you know, how about the stone in a very obese patient? You know, is the stone to skin distance is important? Yes. You know, to, for the success of the thing, because, you know, sometimes it's so obvious that it may not, it, it may, be the, may be beyond. So what is your limit? Uh, the, the distance uh, is the a 10 centimeter, 12 centimeter, 13 centimeter. 
No, I mean, the limit is, uh, I mean, uh, the limit is probably the weight bearing of the table. So most of the problem with uh, obese patients is that uh, at the skin to stone distance is that you have, first of all, you need good imaging to view the stone because in obese patients, this can be difficult. Second, you need to have the stone into focus. We have a machine with 17 centimeters focal distance, which is a lot. And there's very few patients that have uh, a skin to stone distance of 15 or 16 centimeters. So as long as your focal depth is longer or deeper than your skin to stone distance, I think you can be successful. It can be a challenge to position the patients. And so you need some experience to either couple the shockwave source from above, from below, uh, tilt the patient. So it, it's, it's challenging. So uh, another thing I, I was just wondering, because uh, uh, one of the part of the breaking the stone is Steinstrasse. Um, and sometimes they can come with a urethric obstruction and the uh, probably precipitated infection or something. Do you use a DJ stand uh, depend at, at, if the stone size is say more than two centimeter or a three centimeter or something like that? When it is lar uh, larger than two centimeters, I would probably put in a stand, but I try to put in uh, as few stands as possible because there's ample uh, literature that says that it uh, rarely uh, improves the outcome if you put in a stand routinely. Also a stand can uh, make it more difficult for the fragments to evacuate. So, I think a stone larger than two centimeters, if I choose to treat it with ESWL, I put in a stent. <clears throat> I will put in a stent in solitary kidneys, uh, things like that. And uh, for the rest, we, we, we see most of the time what happens. And then sometimes we shock uh, also on uh, Steinstrasse. So it depends on the, on the case, but as few stents as possible, I would say. You know, there was a lot, lots of literature. Hello. Uh, so this is, sir. Hello. Yes, Suresh. Uh, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of interesting things are happening, but we are waiting for another very interesting uh, talk by Dr. Tai, the fourth dimension of lithotripsy. So should we cover that, the new dimension of lithotripsy, the four dimensions? Uh, should we start with that? So I request Dr. Tai to be on the next talk of Art of ESWL, four dimensions of lithotripsy. Dr. Tai, please. Okay, so the uh, four dimensions of lithotripsy, one dimension was the imaging, and we already had that. So I'll uh, move on uh, with the rest of, of the lecture. Uh, first, we will uh, address technology. So we have addressed imaging, now we will go to the shockwave source. As you all know, there's three methods to generate shock waves. You have the electrohydraulic, electromagnetic, and the piezoelectric. In the electromagnetic, you have Witten lens, which is uh, what the technology of Dornier, and there's without lens. I have made this appear the electrohydraulic and the piezoelectric because uh, the modern high performance lithotriptors mostly are electromagnetic and for different reasons the electrohydraulic and the piezoelectric more or less are fading from uh, the ESWL uh, practice. One of the more important uh, things in ESWL apart from imaging is coupling and coupling that means it, coupling of imaging and coupling of the therapy head. And ideally, in a lithotripter, you have versatile coupling of the shockwave source and you have dual imaging. Because when you have this, you can treat all patients supine. Kidney stones and proximal ureteral stones, you will have the therapy head under the table. And for the distal ureter, you will have the therapy head above the table. Kidney stones are usually found with ultrasound, UPJ stones, uh, proximal ureteral stones and then in the ureter you use fluoroscopy. Now, this was the, the coupling of therapy head and imaging. There's also the quality of coupling. 
in the Dornier HM3, we had optimal coupling because both patient and shockwave source were immersed in 1200 liters of this degassed water. Now the uh, acoustic impedance of the human body and water are roughly the same. So that means that the shock waves travel unhindered from the shock wave source to the patient. But in the modern, what we call dry head lithotripters, you need ultrasound gel as an interface. And several in vitro studies have established that air bubbles in this interface in the coupling area between shockwave source and patient significantly affect the energy transfer and hence the disintegration efficacy. So when you have air bubbles in the coupling area, this will impair energy transfer and this will reduce the disintegration capacity. And it is not a problem to find a coupling medium that will officially transmit shockwave energy from the, thera from the therapy head to the patient, but to find a way to avoid entrapment of air pockets during the coupling. And of course, when you couple the therapy head to the patient, it is impossible to uh, view this of, to have a view of this coupling area. That's why uh, Dornier incorporated a video camera in the uh, therapy head. And the image that you see when you couple is that you have a lot of uh, air entrapped in this uh, coupling area. You swipe a hand between the patient and the therapy head. And the result is that you have a complete uh, a coupling area, completely free of air bubbles and the transmission of shock waves will improve because of that. Now, this has a significant effect on the treatment results. As I told you, we can reduce the number of shock waves with about 25%, the in energy level with 22 to 23%. And this will have an effect on the treatment time because if you need 25, uh, if your number of shock waves go down with 25%, then your treatment time will go down with 25%. So the overall result that you, is that you need 43% less energy to fragment the stone uh, with this uh, bubble-free coupling. The guidelines, if you will, or the tips and tricks are, is to use a low viscosity ultrasound gel from a wide mounted container. We use a kitchen spoon to apply it. You apply a thick layer of gel in the center of the water cushion, and then you swipe with the hand between the water cushion and the patient to remove the air bubbles. Ideally, this is done with the optical coupling control or the optic couple. Of course, when you need to reposition the patient for whatever reason, you need to repeat the above sequence. Imaging we have talked about, you can have an inline outline, uh, both for X-ray and for ultrasound. Ideal is the dual imaging, and ideal probably is then uh, both X-ray and ultrasound outline. There's a number of factors that will influence the outcome of ESWL. Uh, there's four mechanisms of stone fragmentation that cooperate to cause dynamic fatigue and in the end stone disintegration. That is the Hopkinson effect, shear forces, quasi-static squeezing and cavitation. Now, cavitation is probably the most important mechanism in stone disintegration, but it's probably also the single most, um, fact, uh, most important factor in the occurrence of acute post ESWL complications. Subsequent shock waves will be impaired by uh, persisting cavitation bubbles uh, from previous shock waves. And these pre-existing bubbles are uh, on, on itself also cavitation nuclei for consecutive shock waves. This will cause a forced bubble collapse and it will reduce stone disintegration efficacy and increase the risk of side effects. The higher the acoustic energy, that means the higher the voltage of your energy source, uh, the more cavitation bubbles. Also, the higher the pulse repetition frequency, the more cavitation bubbles. So a slower shockwave rate will reduce the uh, cavitation occurrence. 
So the guidelines here are the tips and tricks is to reduce the shockwave delivery rate to 60 or 80 shockwaves per minute according to the energy level. The higher the energy level, the lower the PRF. Then you have to use voltage stepping or ramping. That means that you start with low energy and then slowly in the course of the treatment, you increase the energy. You have to start with a low voltage dose of 100 to 200 shockwaves before even starting the voltage stepping or the ramping. And it is also uh, advocated to introduce a treatment pause of one to two minutes after the initial dose of 200 shockwaves. Then we, we touched on that shortly already, then special conditions. Uh, one is ESWA in pediatric patients. I think this is for pediatric patients, the treatment of choice because monotherapy has superior, superior success rates in children because of relatively shorter uh, uh, presence of the stone, softer stone composition, smaller relative volume, smaller body volume to facilitate shock transmission. And children also uh, pass stone fragments more easily because of an increased ureteral compliance which accommodates stone fragments easier. In children also, ureteral stenting is not needed as often as in adults. And it is not clear even if the ureteral stent placement in the end improves stone-free outcomes. So the advantages of ESWN in pediatric patients, it has a proven efficacy. It is the least invasive. Of course, in smaller children, you will need anesthesia. Serious complications are virtually non-existent. It is very well tolerated by children and children pass larger fragment, fragments more readily than adults. Contra, uh, the negative points, of course, there's a negative correlation between shockwave uh, stone-free rate and stone size. This is also true in adults. There's a higher retreatment rate for larger stones, but this is also true in PNL and uh, retrograde interrenal surgery. Ancillary procedure rate is proportional to stone size. This is also to be expected. But stenting probably increases the margin of safety. Tips and tricks. We create a hammock to support infants and smaller children in the gap. For this, we use this uh, incised drape that we cover the gap with. Absolutely important is bubble-free coupling. You have to shield the lung tissue from shockwaves. For this, we use styrofoam. Ultrasound targeting is preferable. In infants and smaller children, you will need general anesthesia. Here, we keep the shockwave rate not higher than 60 per minute, and you will have to adapt the energy level and the number of shockwaves to the size of the child. The smaller the child, the less energy you give. Carefully, of course, monitor the entire treatment, but this is also true in adults, of course. Then we, come, uh, then we come to obesity and Parikh did a number of studies and found out that shockwaves become less effective as the SSD skin to stone distance approaches the focal distance of the litter tripter. Does that mean that you cannot treat obese patients? Uh, no, this does not mean you cannot treat obese patients, it means that it is more challenging than in patients with a normal weight. And in obese patients, the main problem is proper targeting and focusing of the stones. So you need a literature with high resolution imaging systems, both ultrasound and x-ray. You need a literature with versatile coupling of the shockwave source above and under table. And above all, you need, of course, a focal distance of up to 17 centimeters, when the focal distance of the litter is higher or uh, longer than the SSD, then normally there's no problem to put the stone into focus. And of course, there's a number of positioning tricks that you develop uh, with experience. One of the for me, one of the more important issues of ESWL is training. And you see that an F1 car is as good as its driver. The same is true for ESWL. And uh, so this is a study 
uh, that was published in 2014, you see over the time that the uh, results improve, that they improve with the litter tripper, but they also improve with the experience. This is a Japanese study which shows that the uh, results significantly improve after training. So improvement in EQ, uh, effectiveness quotient with a concomitant decrease in complication rate can be achieved with the optimum patient selection and the use of various treatment optimizing strategies. Uh, Lingeman already in 2010 told that good results in ESWL are not only a matter of the technology, but also of the technique. And I wrote in uh, Journal of Endurology that uh, with the newer, uh, what I call plug and play litter tripters, uh, sometimes there's very little training given to the operators. That means that uh, the results go down and uh, in comparison, they have less, ex less experience than the original HM3 users. So in addition to technical advances, education is one of the key factors in maintaining the value of ESWL in the future. And this is from the group of Preminger, the, who also uh, accentuates the importance of training. If urologists make use of a more comprehensive understanding of the pathophysiology and the physics of shock waves, much better results could be achieved in the future. And this may lead to a renaissance and encourage ESWL as first line therapy for urolithiasis in times of rapid progression in endoscopic treatment modalities. So I think apart from the technology, the improvements of in, uh, in technology, imaging, shock wave sources, coupling and things like that, one of the more important factors in achieving good outcome is training, proper education in the use of shockwaves. Um, and then, as was told in the introduction, we edited a small booklet on extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy in a nutshell. I think it's interesting reading. So all you ever wanted to know about ESWL. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tai. It was excellent talk by you. The new technologies, what you have stressed like optocoupling, importance of air bubble, the practice of lithotripsy in pediatric patients. But most important point, what you made, which appealed to me is the training, training and training. I think that is what is missing. Training is very important. We take it very lightly. We get the machine and we start using it without having much stress on the person who uses it. And to my mind, most of the urology is not interested in such uh, lithotripsy sessions. What he feels cutting, putting scopes is more, <laughs> you can understand, is more challenging than sitting on the machine and just looking at the stone and joy conducting the lithotripsy. It's a very important thing. Training, I would say, insist, and I'm sure what you mentioned, the renaissance. For renaissance, what is required is not in the new armamentarium, it's the keen interest of the urologist and training. Thank you very much for enlightening on this topic. Now, we are going to have a trilogue. So far, we are dialogue. In trilogue, we are having C. Malikarjun, Dr. Tai, and Desai, where we'll be discussing the difficult or unique cases to guide us for the urologist, how best we can use the lithotripsy in such cases. So I over to Malika, Dr. Desai and Dr. Tai. Please, thank you. Thank you, thank you Suresh. It was wonderful, Dr. Mahesh, by showing you a volume which can be never even thought about for generations to come. And Dr. Tai, Tali talking about the true technology and how to use the technology at the best. Um, and we, I don't know, sir, your volumes were too, too, too big. The numbers were all, I don't know, the Mahesh Bhai, you are, you are the best into this stone in the volume is concerned. Thank you. I have got, uh, I have got two, uh, two of you to be busy in the next few minutes. Uh, uh, the most important variables, as you've been talking about, is the anatomy of stone, anatomy of kidney, and anatomy of the, pa anatomy of the patient. These are the three things which will definitely decide about the result of the thing. And of course, anatomy of the machine too. 
which you have spoken very well in the next talk of yours about the anatomy of the machine. But anyway, coming to the case one, which we routinely see, this is a 56-year-old gentleman who came with a very vague right flank pain, and the ultrasound shows a right renal calculus. With this sort of a, a CT KUB has become the routine of diagnosis of the retail stones now. Will you go ahead and do an ESW in this case? Dr. Mesh Bhai. Um, what is the Hounsville unit? The Hounsville unit around 1200, I think. So if uh, I'll give a choice to the patient, yep. uh, uh, the size is, uh, I think it is more than 1.5 centimeter. Hmm? Around say, uh, one centimeter, around one centimeter. Yeah. So if I have uh, the new Dornier machine, I will uh, give him a choice. I can do the ESWL because non-dilated system, known uh, simple stone, and um, uh, I can uh, do that. But if he wants, but may require booster therapy, a, a patient uh, may need uh, an under observation. And um, um, so ESWL versus uh, mini park. Dr. Thaili, how about you? Um, well, you mentioned that the Hounsfield units are 1,200. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, the cutoff is 1,000. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is uh, more or less an arbitrary cutoff of mm -hmm. 1,000. I have had very good results with mm -hmm. uh, stones that uh, have Hounsfield units far above 1,000. Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I have uh, a large population of cystinuria patients and they all respond very well to shockwave treatment. So in this case, I would probably do ESWL. The only thing I see is that the kidneys have suffered already a bit. Huh? I just want to understand, do you, need to, do you need to like to see the anatomy of the PCS in general before you go ahead with the ESWL? Um, the, the thing is that <laughs> uh, I'm probably a little bit old school uh, so I like to have an IVU, but so that's the uh, IVU. That's an yeah, IVU. But the problem is that, uh, at least in Europe, um, IVUs are frowned upon. So it is very difficult to obtain an IVU. So yes. if you want to convince your uh, radiologist to give you an IVU on a patient, you need to have uh, some arguments. Fine. So you got if, you argued and you got an IVU now. This is a stone here on the KUB, and that's yeah. a stone here in one of the calices here. Is it in a, is no, it, it looks is like it a collateral diverticulum? Is it a collateral diverticulum? I don't yeah. know, sir. The IVP is there with you. I think IVP is must before you doing the ESW. There is no doubt about it. Because you break the stone, you got to see the outlet. Mm -hmm. The stone fragment must be able to come out. So I would, you know, I, in this case, I would, uh, uh, it looks like I can't see any infundibulum or any collecting uh, mm -hmm. system. This could be a, a collateral diverticular stone. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the ESWL will only relieve the pain, but not, uh, 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 not um, uh, drain the fragment. Dr. Thaili. Well, uh yeah, it's a possibility that is a, a calicial diverticulum, but uh, with only one or two images of the IVU, uh, I think it's uh, impossible to judge if it is uh, indeed a uh, diverticulum. What we probably would do then is do a uh, CT with contrast. Okay. Uh, but as I, as I said, I, I like IVUs, but my radiologist like... So what happened is this guy was observed because with that sort of an anatomy, we were not clear to do neither a PCNL nor a, nor a RIRS nor a ESWL. So we kept quiet. After some time, he came back with a severe pain and the same stone came back into the PUJ. Now I was asking about the Huntsville unit. His Huntsville unit was 1522 actually. With this sort of a thing, will you attempt a ESWL? As you said, Dr. Thaili, you just made a statement. Well, I don't really care about the Huntsville units. How far it is true? Most sometimes I rather not know, but <laughs> this is quite high, fifteen hundred. Okay. I would probably still try and do an inside to ESWL. If it doesn't okay. work, I can still uh, switch to a uh, retrograde uh, ureteroscopy or something like that. I, I still would 
Oh, I understand. Yeah. You see, the question next was, was you see, will you take the Huntsville unit as a dot which is measured here or you create a big region of interest into the stone that will give the true density of the stone? What is your advice in this and what's your experience in this matter? Because this has been a traditional way of putting the Huntsville units, but off late, we have been doing it on a region of interest and find out the minimum is going to be 1100, the maximum is going to be 1587. So what is your comments on that? You probably need a large region of interest. Yes. And also important is a standard deviation, but uh, this is a very small uh, region of interest, so of it could be a hard nucleus of the stone. So I would advise a larger uh, region of interest. But do you practice it, sir? Considering that your the stone that you presented is in the upper, upper ureter, I would probably go ahead and do uh, an insight of treatment. And if, if it is unsuccessful, I have done a treatment, non-invasive, uh, under CEDU analgesia, no anesthesia. So if it doesn't work, then I would probably go for a ureteroscopy. Mahesh, what is your idea or comment on that uh, region of interest? Do you practice it in general? Yes. Um, you see, household unit um, uh, in the center and the periphery, they are different. Um, if house unit is 1500, even if the stone breaks, it breaks in the fragment. It never dusts. I'm interested in dusting the stone, not fragmenting the stone. So, you know, if 1500, I would go for uh, uh, the, the, I will perk it and uh, use a um, laser to dust it and suck it out. Wonderful, sir. So I just, we just, oh, the, sorry. Because if the stone, a house unit is less than 1000, then chances of dusting it much much more with the ESWL. And then that dusting, there would not be any problem in uh, uh, I mean, clearing the stone. We all believe that IVP is the ideal way to understand the calicial anatomy given a choice. I don't deny that fact. Suppose you get a stone like this and you have an anatomy like this. You all know that once it is broken, it definitely descends yeah. to the low calyx. Dr. Thaili, will you attempt ESWL in this patient? It looks very ideal, soft stone, Dihydrate stone, it's very nice, but anatomy of the lower calyx is not good. What's your advice on this case? Yeah, it looks very appealing. So you want to go ahead and do an ESWL. But of course, as you told, the uh, lower pole calicial neck is very broad. It mm -hmm. is long. So probably uh, a lot of your fragments will fall down in the, in the, in the lower pole calyx. So uh, this will be a problem for the evacuation. It will not be a problem for the fragmentation. But that's do you, do you need that's to believe this and you need to, you need to bother on this and really calculate them, Dr. Daisha and Dr. Thaili? Yeah, we published the paper. I mean, yeah, you um, showed it on the slide. We sir. published the paper and, uh, and there is a definitely a difference between the, the um, uh, less than 90 and more than 90, the less than uh, four millimeter infundibulum and more than four millimeter infundibulum. And the complex collecting system, as you've shown in the, this case, mm -hmm. yes. ESW is out of question. This is the previous one. Okay. Thaili? And ECNL is also not going to be easy. Huh? It's not easy. Let me tell you. It is I not prefer ESWL in that patient. I, I might do a micro perk and then the, get access to it then the... I think we discussed about the anatomy of it and knowing the anatomy is very useful that we decided about. Let us come to this another case, a 35-year-old lady, 2.4 centimeter renal stone, horns full unit of 650. Do you accept, as you said, your cutoff was, Dr. Telly was talking about two centimeters. Do you accept this patient? And how far and how far you're sure about the visibility on the fluoroscopy at that point of time? Dr. Telly, please. Um, it's 2.4 centimeters. The only the patient only wants ESWL uh, because in all these uh, cases and discussions, we also have to discuss with the patient uh, because he or she uh, decides in the end. Would I do this? Yes, I would do this. I would not stent it. And uh, will it be visible on fluoro? Uh, this one is a, an easy case to do with ultrasound alone. Mm -hmm. And there I maybe I would need two sessions and the rationale for is always uh, when you do two sessions to start with that portion of the stone that will evacuate first. So I will go for the uh, lower end, lower half of the stone 
fragmented, but if it is 650 in hard field units, then I have a good chance of fragmenting it completely in one session, I think. Dr. Daly, I just have a question here. The question is, if the, page, if the people don't have an ultrasound uh, imaging during the USWL on just a fluoro, how far it will be easy to, to understand unless you show that OptiVision opti, opti vision of uh, Dornier variant is seen better. How do you see that this is possible in a routine flow emissions? When I look at the stone here, I would say that the density uh, a allows good visualization. But as you say, on a little trip, you, you are not in an ideal situation, situation. because you are limited. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, I don't know. You, no. People should understand that what you see on an X-ray and what you see on the lithotripsy machine is going to be different because the things yeah. that they are not going to be same as it is because yeah. with so many other couples which has happened into the kitchen. Okay, yeah. we'll go to the next. This Will this be useful to understand whether it is going to be seen or not? Any of these nomograms which say how good it is seen on the ESW machine, is it any way useful at all? Uh, I have a hard time reading it. Okay, it's a fluoro calculator showing the probability of visibility on the fluoroscopy during SWL, which has been nomogram, which has been said, and the better the better the thing, higher the chance of it uh, uh, being visible. But anyway, I don't think anybody uses. I just wanted to have a question on that. And she underwent a ESWL and a double J stent later, and then an X-ray KV was done, and in, in the immediate post-operative period, which shows a good fragmentation with multiple small doses. It's a little higher day. It is not so well seen on the uh, routine X-ray. It is some uh, some sort of a photoshopping done, so it is very well clearly seen. Otherwise, it was not even seen. So it was seen with small areas of small particles inside the lower calyx. What do you say? It is it a significant stone? Do you need that stone to be there or to be out to be there? Are you happy with the fragmentation? Uh, it's hard to say if the fragmentation is fine enough. But you, this is a five French stent, I think. Yeah, so, four point five. Yes. Yeah, what I would do probably is remove the stent because there was no real indication for putting in the stent unless it was a stone that was obstructive or there was infection or something like that. But after fragmentation, I would remove it. And normally when you remove a stent, you have a window of a couple of days where uh, the stones pass more easily. Of course, this is a lower pole calyx. Uh, evacuation can be slower. But I would say that these fragments can pass if you remove the stent. Okay, my question here is, what do you think that clinically significant fragment post ESWL, Dr. Tiley and Dr. Deshai? See, for RIRS it is there, for PCNL it is there, but what is a significant fragment post ESWL? More than four millimeters. Dr. Tiley. Um, <laughs> that's a very tricky discussion because uh, the literature says there's no clinically insignificant fragments. They can yes. all be significant after time. But I think traditionally for ESWL, when it is a fragment of less than three millimeters, <clears throat> it is considered, uh, uh, depending on the location, it is considered clinically insignificant. So the next question is, how do you really assess the fragmentation during treatment? Majority of the times, one of the biggest problems during treatment is how to assess whether the fragmentation has happened or not. Dr. Tali. Assessment of fragmentation is, I think, uh, more easily done with ultrasound than with X-ray. Um, because uh, when you have good visualization with ultrasound, you really see the fragments jumping. Uh, you can also use the Doppler because when you start with the treatment, will you have a, a very short signal, and when you continue uh, the treatment and the fragmentation progresses, then you will hear a longer signal. And it is like a scraping signal, and this gives you an indication. Of course, uh, yeah. 
technology involved into it. I think you do, as you said in it, it has to be done by the urologist. That only will be understood. And Mahesh was telling it is not the technician oriented thing. It's a urologist oriented thing. One of the major reasons why ESW will get out of the thing was it became a technician oriented treatment rather than a, a clinician oriented treatment. Had it been so, possibly everybody would have understood that philosophy and done the proper job at that time point of time. Dr. Mahesh Bhai, how, how do you assess your fragmentation? Is it ultrasound or fluoro also you take a help of it? No, I, I use um, um, ultrasound as well as fluoro. And um, first thing, as you know, I, I talked about the booster therapy. So once I, I limit my shock wave to 1000 or 1200 shocks for the first because the peripheral part of the stone has a different harmful unit than the central. So when there is fragmented, no point in giving uh, more this thing because it may not reach inside. So I will, I'll stop there. I will assess the next day with the x-ray, really how much fragment has passed off, what is the size of the stone now, and um, uh, or if it is not passed off, whether it is expanded or whether there are cervices, and then after 40 hours, I do the second sitting. So That's possibly so one I, of the. I don't. I don't judge um, on the on the table. But twenty four okay. hours is a proof. For first first day, it gives you the little assessment idea. Okay, it is better. Okay. But you cannot be sure till you see on twenty four when you start passing out. Possibly, I would say, if we can really assess the true fragmentation of all the parts of the stone by some sort of a software, artificial intelligence, or a newer technology possibly the retreatment rates of ESWL can come down significantly. It's only a matter of time before it comes into picture. Dr. Thalia said specifically about the best way to get the best possible results regarding the rate and ramping or stepping up of the Hounsfield unit concern. It is uh, very well. I just wanted to have one opinion on what is your opinion on the dual head? Does it really matter or it is going to collapse the previous cavitation bubble and uh, it is not going to be as effective as it has been said in the in the market or into the literature, Dr. Taylor. Um, dual head was, uh, I think, Paulo Pupo advocated the dual head lipid tripper. I, I'm not aware of any company that still makes dual head lipid trippers. So, so basically, your that the whole thing is if you create one more shock wave and then the cavitation bubble collapses. In fact, it is going to be a counterproductive thing. So dual head things might not be productive. Uh, in breaking the stone. That was one of the philosophies. What do you say on that? I think it was abandoned because it, uh, it was not very useful. That was it. considered useful, but in the end, uh, it was abandoned. Because you what, can... what, what is your idea about the drugs or the percussion measures which have been advised? Do you practice them? Um, I don't use the percussion measures because uh, some, most of the time patients who are very active will object to that because they have to uh, go to the uh, uh, physiotherapy to have this percussion. So most of the time they will not do it. I still, Any drugs? I still prescribe uh, tamsulosine, although there's uh, literature that uh, makes it controversial, but I still use it. Okay, we'll go to the third case. That is a lower calicil calculus in a 65-year-old, a little obese man, asymptomatic. Do you, you just said, I don't care about the, the skin scone distance. How far is it true? Dr. Uh, I don't know because the, here the skin to stone distance was measured in a very peculiar way. Yeah? No, no, not this is, this is not, a, this is only an intention thing that it's a 1500, 58 Hounsfield unit and the size of the stone is 1.5 centimeters. The skin and stone distance was somewhere around 11.2 centimeters. It's not a very obese, but 11.2 centimeters. Well, when I, when I look at this CT, this is what I consider a moderately obese Moderate, not sure. mm, That's it. With uh, 11 centimeters SSD. My mm. little tripper has a focal distance of 17. So I would presume that I can still uh, reach it. Uh, I'm sure that I can reach it and treat it. The okay. only problem is that it is asymptomatic. So does he want it to be treated, uh, things like that. But normally I would not see a contraindication to have a successful treatment uh, in this, what I consider a moderately obese patient. I think Dr. Mahesh has shown his data saying that this, 
the skin and stone distance was one of the one of the good big factors in uh, uh, giving a good result or not uh, we have a good uh, lower calcium lymphadenoblem which is very well seen in a plain ct itself with a 1558 rotamyes they say sir will you do a eswl in this patient what is the house full unit you said 1558 1558 yeah i'll do the mini park yeah okay this is a 1550 tetralogical aspects have been covered by dr taili in the last in the last discussion itself we did a esw in this patient on a donor delta from 22700 shocks with a trained physically fantastic clinician of this nature this is a x ray do you say it is there is some element of strain stress here there are some fragments of around 3 to 4 mm some more fragments it's a good result or a bad result dr taili I, i was looking that there is probably some steinstrasse yeah that is steinstrasse yeah the fragmentation it is uh, i think it's reasonably well fragmented mm -hmm. probably in this case i would have put in uh, a stent which would mm -hmm. have avoided probably a fragment in the ureter mm -hmm. and uh, and i'm not sure here the upper pole is there a substone fragment no, or no it's mostly in the lower pole in the pelvis and in this upper ureter I think the only is wait till the ureter clears and then see if there's still a need for a second session on the lower pole. I just want to understand about how about you achieving a uniformity in the fragment size. Are there any ways to understand or to technological ways to uh, to get that result a uniformity in the fragment size? Uniformity in the fragment size will depend on the uh, the reality or hardness of the stone the uh, size of the stone uh, number of shock waves but he gave 2700 shocks which should be sufficient i i think it's fairly decent for a single session on a large stone i would consider it a good result wonderful this guy he, he, he the, yes sir can i but in yes sir please in this stone if you want to good fragmentation i mean equal size you should start fragmenting from the top near the pelvis then the middle part and then the the lower part and then concentrate on that then um, you will say if you if you target in the center then it is going to be a fragment of a different size but if you start from the top where there is the fluid and then then you come to the middle part and then you come to the end part probably probably you will have a fragment of a smaller size smaller size and so, regarding you ask whether what you did was a good treatment or not from the urologist point of view it is an excellent treatment from the patient point of view it is maybe a bad treatment my sir stones are still there no he he is not no no he is not as he is asymptomatic about stain stress in fact he passed all the stones and is happy about that so we'll come to the last case possibly another 2 minutes The 50, 45-year-old gentleman underwent a left pyeloplasty. At that time, he had a small Randall's block into the clinic, and that was a pre-pyeloplasty scenario with a Randall block-like thing, which we endoscoped during the pyeloplasty robotic. And then he comes back after a year with a large stone of 1,000 Hounsfield unit or one centimeter lower calcium stone. Doctor Pelly, how should kidney? Will you do a lower calcium one? Will you do a ESW or will you accept or not? Is it a horseshoe kidney? A horseshoe. Yes, it's a horseshoe kidney. It's a horseshoe. It's a horseshoe. It's a horseshoe, sir. <laughs> That's a tricky one. Uh, I mean, there's probably no problem. Probably not. Probably problem in fragmenting it, but it needs to evacuate. You mm -hmm. say skin to stone. Of course, it matters. Okay. It matters. Mm -hmm. Here, it will be very challenging because you would have to couple from the front. So I'm not sure I would uh, advocate. how yes, about the change in the patient position like this lateral positioning it's supposed to be said to be good regarding the uh, achieving some fragmentation in some patients in this in this dia i understand imaging during eswl ultrasound is mandatory because it overlaps onto the onto the floor if at all you are doing it so how about it how about this sort of a thing this sort of a position to have a better view of it and better have a clearance on it probably i i would uh, uh, couple my therapy head from above mm -hmm. and not from the side or from the side so mm -hmm. that he 
he can stay supine the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then probably I would use uh, ultrasound, but the evacuation probably will be a problem. Huh? Mm -hmm. This guy underwent a right-sided right -sided pyeloplasty at this time. And after four days later, we, we uh, did an ESWL for this stone. It has a good fragmentation. Nothing is seen on the X-ray, but I don't know, as you said, how about the clearance? I'm not sure. We need to wait and see. This is, we have just did it a month ago. So he has gone back to Bangladesh. He has to come back and then we'll see. How about this? Do you think about a pelvic calculus? You've been saying that I need an ultrasound. Lore is going to be difficult. Ultrasound is going to be a better way of locating it. What is the technical differences or possibly the technical uh, changes what you require for this pelvic calculus or a pelvic kidney calculus? Dr. Desai has seen or shown one case where he has done a, uh, a ESW of the strain stress in the lower ureter and the pelvic calculus also. Dr. Taylor, your opinion on this? Um, here, I think it is very important to have an idea of the anatomy precise That's anatomy. It. Of, of the case, how the it. ureter run and things like that. Huh? That that is it already. Your anatomy is here in the same patient. Because uh, I mean, uh, you can always fragment the stone probably, but it is a uh, fourteen sixty Hounsfield units, uh, two point two centimeters. I don't think I would. I, I would not do it. I think. Okay. This is, uh, this is a similar patient in a graft kidney. So I just wanted to have the question, what I wanted to pose to you was, in a pelvic situations, you need to be very careful in selection of your ESWL. You said you'll take a lower erotic stones without any problem, with the uh, inline lithotriptor that is ideal for scenarios. But for pelvic kidneys, do you think ESWL is good or not? By making a patient supine or patient taking prone during the, uh, during the treatment? I just want both of your opinions in treating pelvic stones in the pelvic kidney, renal pelvic stones in the pelvic kidney. Well, theoretically, you can fragment each and every stone. The, the thing is that uh, the uh, ultimate goal of any treatment is to render the patient stone free. So you have to consider, uh, can I fragment it? Yes, I can fragment it but will it evacuate properly? And that's in pelvic kidneys uh, or in uh, transplant kidneys, the most important issue because you cannot uh, have obstruction and things like that. So um, this is a, not an easy discussion. So fragmenting, no problem, but the, in the end, you want the patient to be stone free without too much uh, problems. So probably I think Mahesh would do a perk on this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think <laughs> no, I think Dr. Tiley has put it in a very small wisdom. His wisdom is very clearly seen. Treating is not fragmentation alone. See no. that the stones do clear. I think we all, majority of the urologists off late in general will get carried away by fragmentation is the treatment of the stone. It is not fragmentation alone. See that whether to clear or not. Dr. Desai, for the final comments, please. Yeah, I mean, um, all the pelvic kidney um, have been developed a technique of PERC and uh, with ultrasound guided, except in that patient who was 101 kg and it was very, very difficult to puncture. And then we tried uh, and it worked, uh, but took many sittings. Uh, in this case, the case which you showed, it is on the, the, on the right side and uh, the, the calyces are dilated and I think you would be able to puncture that kidney um, uh, uh, in supine position and then clear the stone because clearing the stone is very important as you have done and uh, uh, I think the new machines they are have a better coupling and they press upon the abdomen and just like you do the ultrasound puncture they also press and then, then they can do it only thing is, as you correctly said, the fragmentation is not only a uh, thing, it's the clearance of the stone. So I think in most of the time in pelvic kidney, what patient wants a, a complete clearance in the minimum time. And uh, so that is a thing. In ESWL, you have to have a patience for clearance. And as you, as I, my experience is that in those 80% we cleared the stone it took almost one year 
you know slowly yeah. cleared so, so you think... be after that and then it, not only you may be patient but the patient should be patient enough to come to you and then double okay. check but the, what is important as as experience goes i think what dr tel said is the training is very important i see as as we had ex- more experience we could do a better job perfect gentlemen it was very nice talking to you but one thing which was very clearly said by both of you is understand the anatomy of the stone which is very important understand the anatomy of the pelvic health system which is very important understand the anatomy of the patient at the same time understand the technology better how to get the better is the best result of the technology majority of the times majority of the majority of us we don't know what are all the things that can be possible in a single phone what you have and we still we are using the phone so using the machine which you know it very well and how to use the technology in the best possible way to get the best possible results thank you very much gentlemen thank you over to suresh suresh padanka yeah yeah uh, very nice all the three panelists has really discuss length and breadth of the jwl most important thing over here is one has to understand that patient comes to us for a clearance as a urologist we discuss lot of things about the technicalities training fragmentation distance and all that so to my mind when patient comes to me he is expect when i see a senior urologist he will clear my stone without having much invasiveness and that is the bottom line one has to decide of course all these technologies are going to matter but we should also understand because one important point uh, this is sir has said is patience to hold on with the patient for one year is not a small thing every day is going to come to you i gone the treatment uh, my x ray shows ultrasound shows the fragments reassurance and at the end of the one year is very difficult uh, job for any of the Uh, I mean, general urologist to tell the patient wait for one year. I think uh, here one has to take the call. What is the best way of clearing the stones? Techni- technicalities of which technique to be used, of course, with us. But for patient, is it is a clearance that matters because once you give some treatment, at least in our country, the patient understanding is one time treatment. That also is very important, and most of the urologists will should decide. what way i can give the total clearance with minimum invasive that is very good i we start taking the questions and answers from all the three panelists the first question is the our guest panelist dr tai how do you decide that how much how many shocks a uh, max you can give in one session without compromising the safety how do you decide especially again in pediatric patient is there any way you decide to so when to stop what you mention is i give 2700 when to stop to give the shocks question to dr tai well as i said i'm quite careful uh, <clears throat> i don't like to over treat or uh, cause damage to the kidney what we experience with optical coupling is that we could bring down the number of shock waves with 25% and also the energy level with 25% So uh, since we have this optical coupling, I would rarely in an adult patient give more than fifteen hundred shocks at a level of four to five. In children, it will depend on the size of the patient, and it, it depends on the weight and the body habitus. The smaller the child, the less shock waves you need, and the lower the energy. So in a child, I would la- rarely go higher than one thousand shocks. and i would do this at 60 shocks per minute in adults i would go to 80 shocks per minute and uh, on a delta for a child i would not go higher i think than 3 or f- level 3 or 4 that's also because uh, especially in a child we will use uh, ultrasound you have a real time image and a real time idea of the fragmentation so you can uh stop the treatment whenever you think fragmentation is enough so in order to avoid giving more shocks than actually needed thank you dr tai uh, one more question here is earlier there were some papers showing that there is some amount of damage with the excessive amount of lithotripsy used 
so can you add now it's a treatment is there for decades together are there any papers publications or research the long term effects of the kidney function in a patient who has received lithotripsy on kidney function i think long term research has showed there's uh, no uh, real damage or uh, deterioration of kidney function there has been some uh, discussion about hypertension and things like that or diabetes but in fact it is the uh, stone disease in itself that is uh, hazardous for the patient and will uh, induce hypertension or diabetes in the patient it is not the treatment or the ESWR treatment in itself okay thank you the next question is what is the most critical factor in measuring the outcome of lithotripsy it is the body mass index or skin to stone distance or both uh, dr malik you can also answer this question no i think i, I think uh, it's a very very well known fact as the as, as the patient becomes the uh, mass index is more and the skin and stone distance is more the chances of fragmentation and success is less as dr tailey very clearly said it is the focal distance of the lithotripter you can't have a, a body mass index outside the focal distance of the lithotripter if the focus distance is going to be smaller and possibly it will not your stone your shock wave doesn't don't touch the stone at all oh. you will not be able to reach the stone gone are no. those days that hmi where uh, the hm3 where the focal distance is too large but now the focal distance is limited and fix it we can't go beyond that okay okay uh, how do you ensure this question to dr yeah. desai the one of the participant asked how to ensure bone or lung is not in the shock wave path with outline imaging to decide what to do so only thing is uh, you protect i showed you on the deck, uh, my slide that yeah. you protect the, the lungs with the the yeah. uh, porous material so the shock wave does not travel it get disintegrated so it is very important to protect the lung especially in children and the gonads um, if you are using a fluoroscope yeah. i think this is a very very uh, important okay the next question is regarding stenting is it do you do it uh, in routinely all cases or what is the criteria apart from the size um i do the stenting if patient has a stone in the pelvis uh, so where and um, there is a hydronephrosis okay i need to drain so i'll i'll, I'll drain the kidney so it protect the kidney and then um, since the stent is there i can go on uh, giving a uh, 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 shock waves but as you as i explained to you in my talk that i don't give more than 1500 shocks per per session so i divide that into a, 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 a stage manner uh, do the booster therapy after 48 hours uh, so then the the small fragment will pass off by the side and the kidney will be protected he would not have a pain and then slowly provided the stone is um, um less than 2 cm and hounsful unit is less than uh, 1000 to 1200 so stenting is to protect the kidney i don't think um, right. if the stone fragments are large it will not uh, but then after some time you take out the stent the even the fragment will pass it off you right right uh, this question is for all the three panelists when you are doing lithotripsy what is your end point when do you decide the treatment is not working how long how far will i answer if i there after the first sitting there is no stone um, breakage then i will not use the usw i'll go and take it out by the pcnl or whatever is required okay. so first sitting if there is no break in the um, in the stone then i will not used so sometimes the cracks are seen in uh, sometime few days after the first session that is also been seen yeah, it is not you take it not broken it is taken more even if it is crack is seen once is fragments it will be in larger pieces okay i need a dust okay. now i realize after all these years the best way to treat the stone is dust the stone okay. uh, whether any you do, <laughs> whether you do <laughs> or whether you do yes 
I think Dr. Dr. Sayu, what is your Amali, what is your end point? No, no, my feeling is true. It's a balance between what you expect and what the patient expects. <laughs> if he's ready to get a two or a three stage sitting for a larger stone, I don't mind. But given a choice to me, I would see if the stone in, in the all parameters, whatever we thought about, if they consider that in one sitting, the stone is going to come at least fragmented completely, then I'll attempt. If the, anywhere I feel that it is doesn't require, it, it is not possible to do it in one sitting, I would think about other options of treatment which are readily available to the patient at this point. Time. Okay. In case if that fellow requires a second sitting by chance after a 70% breakage or some sort of it, that's okay. That doesn't matter. But for all me, one sitting should be planned. And that is is that is it. Great. Uh, Dr. Tai, what is your endpoint for ESW? Uh, I'm afraid there's no simple answer to that. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it depends on a number of factors. It depends on the stone, depends on the patient. But as you said, sometimes like for your radial stones, you make an x-ray immediately after the treatment and nothing has changed. You wait a couple of days and you, then you see that it is fragmented. So I would not go on forever, but uh, depending on the stone, the location, the size, and the, what the patient wants, uh, I would probably give a second session uh, if I think that the second session would help. If not, then I will uh, defer and go to another type of treatment. All right. Uh, there's a question from one of the audience that uh, we talk about HU uh, Hounsfield units and they decide the hardness. Uh, how far the X-rays are correct to decide about the hardness of the stone? If city is not available, I mean, I can understand that in peripheral areas, uh, general areas may not have access to all these gadgets. Do you advise to take this call only on the X-ray? This question to Mali and Dr. Mahesh. Probably they will not agree with my statement. X-ray will give you a fair idea. Right. You know, that is, that is what we, we were used to it before CT scan. And, and if you look properly, the, the X-ray will show you if the margins are very clear on X-ray, it's a hard stone. If margins are a little wavy, it is a mixed stone and the porous stone will be seen as the irregular stone and but in you know, one side. So, you know, a, a, a fairly good idea you will get it. And now after doing this, we used to do a PCNF and we used to see the houseful unit is uh, say 1400. And when you look at the PCNL, the stone is um, hard, but it is porous. So the ultra structure of the stone not always resembles the household in it. So, so you got to um, you got to um, um, see the margin, see the size, and how the sphere spherical is there, how the shape. I think that is important. Right, right. Suresh, I think I think basically what happens is after the CT has come, we started look, we started uh, stop targeting stopped analysis in our brains. We see that number and we create our own impressions onto it. Before that, everybody used to see a plain x-ray, good plain x-ray KUB, see the density of the stone and the whole bloody thing started with Stephen Decker's densitometry of at that point of time, 30 years ago, how the how the stone looks like and how this the consistency of the stone is concerned. So we start looking at it so keenly as we used to look once upon a time. Now we see the figure written on the stone by an X-ray CT technician rather than the stone on an X-ray KUV. We got used to it, that's all. Yeah. In fact, uh, one more thing has not been highlighted. Yeah. Uh, one more thing has not been highlighted during discussion is the volume. Because we are probably only talk about the area. Volumetry is also equally important. Many times a stone which is being seen in AP view uh, may not give the... Is there any importance of volumetry in deciding? We are talking only about the two centimeters and all that. But is it the volumetry is it not important? I think Dr. Thayli to answer this. Of course, ideally, we would have volumetry on all the stones, but that is uh, probably not practical. And... Uh, <laughs> Maybe sometimes, as uh, Dr. Malik said, we overthink it, like judging the density of a stone on a KUB. It's what you call the carpenter's eye. Eh? So it's the experience that you can judge uh, from a KUB. This is a hard stone. This is not a hard stone. Volumetry is interesting and would help us probably. 
in fine tune the treatments, the treatment plannings, but it is uh, hardly, uh, it is not very practical to do in each and every patient. Uh, Dr. Desai, you talk about uh, volume of the stones in your many research papers. Any opinion? Yeah, it is. It is. I found the that the when you previously we used to have a two directional. Now we have a three directional, and when you do the CT scan, you can do the three dimensional uh, picture. And suppose you have a a three hundred cubic millimeter, you know, okay. and that is that is actually two centimeter stone. But when yeah. you uh, three hundred, you say okay, you will break the stone into two millimeters. Right. So you calculate so how much stone dust will have. Right. It's so nine o'clock. Little idea that uh, you know what you are going to be end result when you do that. Right. You know? So here you are you are leaving to the kidney to throw the stone out. Yes. Unlike PCNL, where you suck it out or ureteroscopy, you basket it out or whatever it is. You are you are leaving it. So you make sure that the stone fragment is two millimeter, and then you, if you have a cubic millimeter, you would have a rough idea that um, how much fragment would be there and what would be the outcome. Okay, so last I'm not, question. I'm not, I'm not telling that it, it is a perfect, but over the period you will you will uh, judge uh, predicting before and what happens afterward. And when you have a uh, 30, 40 cases, you will have a good judgment. Uh, lots of questions are coming, but there is a time constraint. I'm sure uh, we'll send the answers uh, to all this uh, audience. Many questions are there, very interesting questions are there. I'm really thankful to all the three panelists for enlightening us for this new wine and new bottle. As I said in my opening remark, these are the same lithotripsy what we used to do 30 years back, 40 years back. Something new has been happening, I'm sure. We are all look forward for the renaissance of the lithotripsy over the mineral energy technique. We don't know. It may take over the today's all technologies and something new may happen. Thank you very much, everybody. Obviously, the next dialogue will be there on the 18th of January. I again uh, convey my thanks to Dornier, all the three my uh, panelists, the Indian School of Urology and USI. Over to Dr. Raju. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was an interesting uh, webinar, a revisit uh, to ESWL and its status in the current era. It was interesting to listen to all the giants in neurology speaking on various aspects and the status and what one should do. And I, on behalf of USI and Indian School of Urology, thank uh, Professor Taylor, Professor Mahesh Deshai, uh, uh, Dr. C. Mallukarjun, uh, for sparing the valuable time and enlightening everyone about the various aspects on US ESWL. I again thank Donier and Healthware for all the support to USA and I, uh, ISU for having this uh, ESWL series. We will have the next one on uh, 18th of Jan, that is uh, session two on uh, this dialogue, ESWL dialogue series from uh, 7 to 9 p.m the same schedule and I wish everyone who had participated in this uh, webinar, uh, uh, thank everyone who has participated in this webinar on behalf of uh, USI ISU. Thank you all once again and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye Dr. Daly. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye Daly.